everybody. Welcome to Women Rocking Hollywood 2018. This is the third year of promoting female filmmakers to fans and supporters of women in film. And this year, we have some of the very best films that have come out this year have been directed by women. We have Lynn Ramsey's You Were Never Really Here, Christina Cho's Nancy, Chloe Zhou's The Writer, uh, Deborah Granick's Leave No Trace, and then documentaries RBG by Julie Cohen and Betsy West, and Amy Adrian, uh, Half the Picture, and that's just to name a few. And so here we are in 2018, and we have a panel representative of some of the best filmmakers working today, and I'm going to, uh, they're super powerful women, and they're powerful not just in the sense of what it means to be powerful in Hollywood, but what it means to be authentically powerful, which is not just talented, engaged, and passionate, but they're collaborative and cooperative, and we're honored to have them all here. Let me quickly introduce them to you, and then we'll start asking them questions. I will be asking them questions. Uh, Kristen Schaefer is, uh, works with Women in Film LA, and uh, with Women in Film LA, they have just made a huge number of initiatives happen this year, and she just got uh, invited into the Academy this year. Which is oh. exciting. <laughs> it is. Kat Gandler is, started out, uh, well, she uh, had an indie film that was hugely successful and well-reviewed, um, Hellion, and then through that, she met Ava DuVernay, and then she directed on the first season of Queen Sugar, and then she was the producing director on the second season, and now she's the showrunner of Queen Sugar. Nice. And um, Patricia, Patricia Cardoso, uh, did uh, Real Women Have Curves, which is a lot of people's favorite movie. And Ava was grateful and thrilled to have her on, on this season of Queen Sugar, so excited to have her here. And then Regina King, who is just got nominated for an Emmy. Uh, she's award-winning as an actress, but now she's starting to do directing, and she has been for some years, so we're very excited to have her here today. And she um, worked on uh, a um, pilot for this year called The Finest. She's worked on The Good Doctor, This Is Us. Um, she's done the docu documentaries. And um, so, welcome, Regina. And then Rosemary Rodriguez has <laughs> she's worked on The Good Wife and The Tick and The Walking Dead and Jessica Jones and Rise, but she's also done two films that she wrote and directed that were also very well, Got won a bunch of awards, Acts of Worship and Silver Skies, and she worked on a pilot this year of Cagney and Lacey, so welcome Rosemary. And then Patricia Riggin, who also worked on a pilot this year, uh, and it's got picked up for this fall called Proven Innocent. Yeah, and she nice. did three episodes of Jack Ryan, so she's super on trend <laughs> at, at Comic-Con this year. But she also worked on The 33 and Miracles from Heaven. So, Patricia Regan. So, Kristen, so much has happened this year. So much has happened with uh, Me Too and Time's Up and um, so many initiatives have been put into place and have made a really, I think, big difference in terms of inching things forward for women, especially on the small screen. Can you talk a little bit about some of the, I mean, they're just wonderful. You've got a helpline for harassment. You've got Reframe. Talk a little bit about all these wonderful things that have happened through Women in Film this year and from your perspective, how everything is going. Sure. <laughs> um, no pressure. Let me start talking about how everything's going, and then I'll... Yeah, okay. yeah. So Women in Film is a 45-year-old organization. And in the history of the organization, we've seen a lot of firsts, right? So we've seen the first women to run studios, to run networks, to be nominated for Oscars, to win Oscars. This year, we saw the first woman DP nominated for an Oscar. She did not win, but she will win one day. Yes. <laughs> she was great. Yes. Um, and, um, I mean, it, that's the good news. Um, the, the, the other good news is that there's huge conversation around this issue. There's a lot of social media. There's a lot of press. Um, the statistics haven't really changed. 
We are really hoping that when we, in the beginning of 2019, when we see the 2018 statistics, that we are going to see some numbers rise in a way that we haven't. Um, the feature films haven't really changed. I mean, they go up a little bit or go down a little bit. But over the last 11 years, 4% uh, of the top grossing movies have been directed by women. And of those, only eight of them were women of color. Uh, one of them is on this panel, and Patricia Regan. Yes. <laughs> Um, in television, 17% of um, episodes are directed by women, 23% are creators, so that, that's a little better. Um, I really believe those numbers are going up as we speak, we just don't have the data yet. And I think some of the women will speak to that a little bit um, you know, a, a, around the, the kind of work they're getting and what they're seeing. Um, and there's a couple of engines that are, that are driving the change. So every studio and network has a program. Um, there's a lot of the you know, independent film organizations like Sundance Institute or Film Independent in Los Angeles or IFP in New York that have programs. We started a program about, um, uh, we launched it a year ago. It's Women in Film Los Angeles in collaboration with the Sundance Institute and 50 ambassadors. It's called Reframe. And we really work inside the system. We think that um, the problem doesn't exist in one place or another, it exists everywhere. So it's a problem um, at the agencies, at the studios, at the networks, at the management companies, um, in the unions, in front of the camera, behind the camera. And the way to make the change happen is to work in every single area at the same time and, and, and push all at once to, to make that change happen. So our program is called Reframe and we launched um, we officially launched a year ago. We started signing partners this winter. We signed, I think, 35 um, networks and studios out of the gate, companies like Lionsgate and HBO and Showtime and Amazon and Netflix have all signed on to this. They're all committing to gender parity. They're all committing to change within their organizations. And how does that actually take form? Is, is it like a signature? Is it an actual, I mean, how are we, what are you seeing? We have a set of programs that we have started rolling out. We rolled out the stamp first. So we right. started awarding the reframe stamps um, in June. And of the top 100 grossing films, there were 12 films that got the stamp. So these are films that um, are getting close to 50-50 in front of and behind the screen. There's a whole point system that's a little detailed. It's all on our website. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's really interesting, so you should check it but out. But I'll just say that you know, some films you'd expect, like Wonder Woman or Girls Trip, some films you might not expect, like My Little Pony and Smurfs. <laughs> um, uh, you know, Pitch Perfect, The Post, did I say Lady Bird, Everything, Everything. So a whole, a whole sort of array of, of films um, that got the stamp. And so one of the things you all can do as, um, as, as audiences are support films and television shows that have the reframe stamp. So in the fall, we'll start rolling out the stamp for TV. And so um, the films and shows will all be on our website. Sometimes they'll be on the shows or on the films or in the marketing material. So when you see the reframe stamp, that's like seeing like, you know, a, um, a LEED certification or a USDA organic stamp, like something that says like, this is endorsed by the, you know, organizations that are leading gender, gender parity. And can you uh, just mention Flip the Script? Because I think some people think that we're talking about this and yes, we have numbers, but if you really want to see what it's like for women in film. I mean, I yeah. think it's a fascinating collection of, of we, shorts. We made a couple of short films where we switched the gender roles. So we took stories that women had told us about their experiences and ways that they had been discriminated against, and we cast the men into, into women's roles. Um, and they're, they're funny. It's, you know, so it's using humor to just point out like the crazy stuff that happens when a female director shows up on set, and the male crew is like, there's no way you're the director. And she's like, dude, I'm the director. And they're like, go get me an apple from Crafty. And so it's, yeah, it's, it's totally turning it on, on its head. So again, those are also on our website. And uh, so also if you can mention the uh, harassment helpline. Sure. So. Um, when the Harvey Weinstein story started breaking in October, um, and I was doing a lot of press, and I was um, trying to, to figure out the resources to send people to, and I was like, there, there's not a lot. Um, and so we started a, a helpline 
Um, and so women who work in the entertainment industry, um, particularly in California, because that's where our attorneys are, but, but of course we will help anyone, um, can call in and um, get, get referred to pro bono attorneys, to support groups, to counselors. We've gotten, um, you know, we've gotten hundreds and hundreds of calls. It's really interesting the kind of calls we're getting. Some are like people who are dealing with something on set right now and need to know how to figure out what to do. Oh, that's good. Others are like people who had something happen to them, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, but have, have been holding it inside that whole time and just really want to tell somebody what happened. Mm -hmm. Just want, they want someone to, to hear their story. Um, and so our, you know, the, the women who answer the helpline are able to do that. And, um, and then provide these resources. And it's, I think what's so great about that and all of these, m many of what you're, of the programs you're talking about is it's really very, ac it's, it's, it's action oriented stuff. It's not, you know, oh, we need to solve the problem. It's like, you're, how do we do it? Here's how we do it. Let's put this in place. And then it's actually changing. Yeah, things. it's um, all of our programs are well researched. So we start with research, understanding the, the problem from uh, statistical analysis, understanding why it came to be the way that it is, and then putting solutions in place to help it. If I could just tell you one more thing about the helpline, we got a call um, uh, last month from a young girl outside of Los Angeles, not working in the industry, who was like having something really terrible happen to her. Um, you know, via the internet, um, and we were able to, it's like not exactly what we do, but I think it's important to help wherever we can. We were able to connect her to the police in her, in her town and, and get her immediate help. And so I think this speaks to the ripple effect that Hollywood has, right? So we're telling stories that are, that are disseminated all around the world. So the representation on screen really matters because it's what people are seeing you know, everywhere. Um, and the same is true of the helpline because when she Googled you know, you know, how to get help, uh, she came. She came to us because it's high profile. Because we have you know celebrities talking about our helpline, so it was the first thing she could find. And so I think it gives an added responsibility to um, to our industry to you know do the right thing whenever we can. Thank you so much. It's really important work. So women in Film LA. They're on Twitter. They're everywhere. You and look at them up on the website. So uh, Kat. You have just moved very, I mean, look, you've been in the industry a while, yes. but what a wonderful three years it's been and what a beautiful product, what a beautiful uh, family you, you guys have created in Queen Sugar. Can you talk a little bit about your journey from being uh, a director to being the showrunner and, and then also a little bit about this, this season and the uh, surprises that you've experienced as part of the show, being showrunner? Yeah, so I, I've lived in Texas for 20 years. I didn't go to film school. I got my degree in creative writing, and I moved to Texas knowing that I wanted to make movies. I had no idea how they were made, and took a couple of classes and just started making stuff. And I pretty much lived in the independent film scene in, in Austin, Texas for a good little while. We had our, a really cool group of filmmakers with really diverse voices, and. Um, I came up through uh, the, Sun, the Sundance world. I had a couple of shorts at Sundance. I had a short called Hellion that played the same year that uh, Ava's Middle of Nowhere played, and that's sort of how we found ourselves in the same room and connecting, and she's just such a, you know, one of those warm, amazing human beings that you imme immediately gravitate towards. And we just found ourselves kind of moving through the independent film world for a couple of years. She was at South By in 2015 giving a keynote uh, and basically came up afterwards and was like, hey, I'm making this television show. I'll back up a second. So I had a feature at Sundance. And you think, okay, you get into Sundance, like you fall to your knees, sobbing. This is like the holy grail of filmmaking, as many of you guys know. And you think all the doors are gonna like just fly open and you're gonna get that three picture deal at wherever. And, um, you start going into the meetings and collecting the water bottles and, and television in particular, it's like, okay, uh, we love your work. You would think you're a fantastic filmmaker, but until you have that first TV episode under your belt, then come back to us. And it was the repeated phrase that you hear over and over and over again. 
So flash forward to 2015 after countless doors and countless rejection, and um, Ava was like, I'm making this TV show. Would you be interested in directing an episode? And at that point, you're just like, please, God, <laughs> yes. I'll do anything with you. I'll do anything. Yeah, it would be amazing. And then, uh, so she, first season is probably the story many of you guys know. She basically had a full roster of female directors. I think probably 90% of them had never directed television before. But it was a collection of artists that she just really loved or connected with who made phenomenal films, like phenomenal films that weren't getting the opportunities. And I was lucky to be one of those people. And it was, the show is not only like a, such a beautiful creative space to make art, which was the first thing that she told, I think a lot of us is like, you know, what kind of look or style or aesthetic. And she was just like, make art like make art in the frame and tell beautiful stories. And at what point, I don't know, in television do you get, do you hear that? Um, and so from there, uh, the next fall, she <laughs> just was like, hey, would you be interested in being producing director next season? And like, I have no idea what that means, <laughs> but um, I'll look it up and I'll figure it out. <laughs> and um, with that, I took kind of everything that I, wanted to know the first season about TV directing and created like an orientation packet for incoming directors, knowing that everybody coming in had never directed TV before. So what is a tone meeting? What do you do on it? How does the tech scout work? Like all of these little pieces to the process and put together this packet so I could give to all my directors. I put together a lookbook of the aesthetic and the style and the language of the show to give to my directors and just created a space, a very educational space, again, because we're all, we were all brand new to it. Um, and, got, and I think when, one of the huge benefits of being a producing director was I get to sit back, help all of these amazing, Patricia was one of our second season directors, Julie Dash was one of our second yeah. season directors, like mind blowing that they haven't had an opportunity before in TV. But then I, as a student, get to watch each and every one of them and learn from them as directors. And then we had a great second season. Fall comes around, or I think it was like late summer. Ava's like, hey, would you be interested in show running? I'm like, I have no idea <laughs> how you do that. Never been in a TV room before, never wow. TV, like TV writing. And, um, but I'll figure it out. <laughs> and. Uh, was, had some very generous uh, other showrunners who kind of educated me and, you know, at the end of the day, it's storytelling. It's good storytelling. It doesn't matter what note cards you use or the magnetic strips on your note cards or anything like that. It's just beautiful storytelling. Um, and it's been an incredible, I mean, <laughs> it's been a magical, incredible journey that I sincerely, Ava, you know, changed so many of our lives by giving us that one opportunity. and. You know, we had 25 directors over three seasons, female directors who are now out into the world doing American Crime, Halt and Catch Fire, like all of these amazing shows that weren't given the opportunity prior to. So Ava is just like our guardian angel to so many of us. Um, but surprises, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's just good storytelling. It's not, um, there's not a whole lot of uh, mathematics or like science that are in some secret books. It's just making the story work. Yeah. yeah. And then bringing together the collaborative elements of the directors with the aesthetic of the show. And no assholes. We have a no asshole policy. There's a sign. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. So Patricia, I guess you're not an asshole. Good for you. <laughs> So can you talk a little bit about what the journey was from, you'd done this really amazing, I love that movie so, so much. Uh, Women Who Have Curves, I watch it. I think a lot of us, I watch it repeatedly. It's it's awesome, awesome movie. So what was the journey from that to being asked to, to be on the show as a guest director? And then how did you bring your aesthetic to uh, your episode that you worked on? Okay, well, you know, it only took 15 years from <laughs> directing the feature to being asked to direct an episode. And, you know, and, you know, the film did uh, extremely well. It was made for HBO just to be broadcast on cable, but uh, eventually it was the first HBO movie released theatrically. It did make a lot of money. 
And then I got uh, into this like writing development, no, directing development deals with the studios. I had a project with Halle Berry at Universal, a project at Disney with, that Hannah, with Anne Hathaway. And each of them would take like three years and I supervised writers. And then they went into turn around, didn't get made. But meanwhile, I was trying to direct television. And at my agency, I was at ICM at the time, um, none of the, TV agents would represent me. They told me, no, we cannot get you a TV job because you've only done features and features, independent filmmakers, they cannot work fast enough. So eventually I left my ag that agency because of that reason. So I moved to another agency where I knew a TV uh, um, agent and I asked him, and I had gotten at that point, I had directed a television movie, and I asked him, would you represent me? And then he said, yes, this is gonna be a piece of cake, we can get you jobs in no time because you're a woman, you're a minority, like you check two boxes, I'll get you a job like in no time. Five, year, five years went by, he couldn't get me one meeting, not one meeting. And, and then, um, like, Eva DuVernay called me this year, and then she told me, do you want to direct an episode of Queen Sugar? And of course, and uh, I've already like booked two shows that I'm directing, and I have all these meetings to direct other ones, and again, you know, it's just, it's her, like she's the one person that has completely changed my life, you know, and my family's life, because, you know, it's very hard to make a living if you're not working, if you're a director and you don't, you don't work, it's, it's really hard. So uh, it was, you know, it, that's been my journey. And in terms of bringing my aesthetic, you know, since having Kat as the showrunner was a blessing because she's like so organized and she created this like uh, lookbook that it was really uh, instrumental in help, helping me understand what is the aesthetic of the show and how, how it works. So, uh, and what things can I contribute or change and what things have to stay the same way. But Eva is also, she's always like, you know, go for it, you know, change it. And Kat is also to just make it beautiful and make your day. That's all what I care about, <laughs> make your day. And um, so it was a wonderful experience. And so what are the, what, what projects that are um, upcoming for you can you talk about? Let's hear them. Um, yeah, I'm directing a, episode for a new TV show for the CW that shoots in Toronto, and then I'm directing another episode for a new Netflix show that shoots in New York. And um, Not ones we can know the names of. Uh, the, yeah, you can know their names. Okay. The, that would be C good. The CW is called In the Dark, and the Netflix is called Tales of the City, and that one stars Laura Lini, Ellen Page, and Olympia Dukakis. Oh, that's oh, lovely. Yeah. And have you found that you are being asked to work across genres, or are you being brought into meetings for any specific kind of style of TV, or is it really quite a diversity of, of, of things you're being offered now? Uh, you know, the, so far they've been like dramas. Um, you know, but I think I have to say that it's still it has not been easy for like my agents to get me meetings. You know, like at first I was not getting like many meetings, and I'm like getting all nervous. Uh, so, you know, it's still it's not easy, but um, interestingly enough, like um, next week I'm interviewing for another show that is like a fantasy horror, which is really exciting because it's something I haven't done before. That's wonderful. Thank you. So, Regina, you're a busy girl. <laughs> uh, and congratulations on your Emmy nomination. I would tell you guys to go see her on, in Hall H later, but we all know that's not going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. so, but we will see it later. We can always watch it. So uh, in addition to your acting and, and to having created this incredible character with uh, Seven Seconds, which if you guys haven't seen it, you really should, can you talk a little bit about what drew you to wanting to start to direct and what part of your soul it feeds that's different from the acting? Well, um, for those of you that don't know, I've been an actress for longer than some people out here have been alive. 
Um, and um, the beautiful thing about um, being an actor is that uh, while I didn't go to film school, I, I'm, at, I'm at school all the time. So um, I'm a bit of a controlled enthusiast. <laughs> and being that, um, I would say maybe around, when I was maybe around 30, 35, somewhere in there, I realized that while I still love to act, I wanted to be more involved with the entire production. As an actor, you really, um, pretty much you're working with the director, the other actors, and the wardrobe designer. Um, and it was just always was so fascinating to me on set when I would just like sit back and watch all the different people the director would talk to and everyone, um, unfortunately, usually was he, um, uh, would interact with and the, the decisions that um, they would come up with. And then working with some directors that weren't the best directors. And I think ha having that contrast between directors that I feel like really cared about the actor's process mm -hmm. and the directors that didn't um, inspired me even more to want to be a director. Um, I feel like um, I was very much aware of directors that seem to not do their homework. Mm. And that's frustrating as an actor. And just, again, that inspired me to, I wanna do that one day. And um, I was doing a, um, a interview on the Monique show and there was this artist on there named Jaheem, and he was like, um, would you be in my video? And I was like, oh, I don't do videos, no. And then I thought about it, you know what, this might be an opportunity. And we had exchanged numbers, so I called him later that evening, and I was like, I'll be in your video if I can direct it. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, have you ever directed before? And I was like, no, but I can do it. <laughs> Meanwhile, my heart is beating. So um, um, Atlantic Records, he, he let them know and they reached out to me and they were like, have you ever wrote a treatment before? And I was like, sure, <laughs> yes, I have. And they were like, well, you've got to send us a treatment. And I'm like, sure. So now I'm really panicking. My heart is in my throat. And um, luckily I have a lot of directing friends, writer director friends, so I've like reached out to them and um, asked what, I, what do I do, where do I start? And uh, one of my friends, Tim Story, is a dear friend. We went to high school, junior high, college together. And um, he said, just, you love music, just tell a story with a song. So I just sat with the song for a few hours and just started writing and just trusted myself to do it and uh, had um, another writer, director, friend, Dwayne Johnson Cochran, not The Rock, <laughs> um, read it over for me and just like check typos or whatever and I sent it in. So that was like the first thing that I did and it gave me just like the confidence to stop saying, you know, I wanna be a director and say, I'm gonna be a director. I am going to do whatever I possibly can to show that this is not a vanity thing. I truly have stories to tell. And um, I reached out to uh, Paris Barkley, who has been an, an amazing mentor, and I showed him the video and he watched it without the volume. And he was like, oh, oh yeah, you're serious about this. You told a story. So he pointed me in the direction of the Warner Brothers Directors Workshop and uh, the ABC um, Directing Program, which is a program for diversity for people of color and women. And he said that when people see that you're really taking this seriously and seeing that you will take time out of your acting schedule to- People will, um, will take you seriously. You know, sharpen. And um, Christopher Chulak, who was the, uh, 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 um, producing director on Southland. He allowed me to shadow him and Nelson McCormick. It's funny because I've had men be such huge champions uh, for me. John Wells, 
um, and they just all like told me, yeah, you, you can do it. And um, sometimes you just feel like, I think in a lot of ways, we feel like we need permission mm -hmm. to do something, even though we don't necessarily need it. You just feel like you need permission and a fan, a cheerleader. Yes. And um, all of them were really They're right big. here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, I mean, just even walking in here, Rosemary was giving me a pep talk that, ooh, that um, I didn't even realize I needed until, I, you know, we're walking in. I was like, yes, thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and just the, I, I just have had just really, really, um, really strong support. You know, even for my agents, uh, I have, have had some friends that uh, director, actor directors that were like, don't stay with your agency, you know, go find another agency because there's going to be a conflict. And when all, in all honesty, it wasn't that, it was that I needed to find the agent, the lit agent at my agency mm -hmm. that was the right fit for me. Because I, I, I don't, um, I, I shoot straight from the hip, so I need someone that can do that as well. So I was lucky, and I've got that agent, Sean. He's out there, he's Sean Friedman. Um, but uh, and he works seamlessly with my talent agents, and and so it's been this um, wonderful dance where the two arms of the agency respect each other's department and want to see me win in both. So um, we 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 do a pretty badass dance to make this acting and directing work. Was that the question you asked me? I can't remember. It doesn't even matter. It's a, it was a beautiful answer either way. I love that you mentioned about doing research because one thing that I hear over and over again for all the women in film, all the female filmmakers, research for them is key and it's always, they're always overprepared, which I think is... Well, is that's the beauty of being a director. I mean, I feel like everybody up here agrees with, we are constantly learning. We're learning, you learn more about yourself, you learn more about communicating with people and different styles of communicating and how you have to incorporate those different styles of communicating. What might work for one actor definitely doesn't work for another actor. Even being an actor, sometimes you don't win over an actor, and you're like, okay, here we go. This, this is what it's going to be. <laughs> Roll up my sleeves like a little higher. <laughs> um, but that's one of the things that I think makes this so attractive to us, even with the long pauses. Reason why you don't give up is because you are still that, that desire to learn and, and tell the story while you're learning just never goes away. You know, I, I've, I've always had it. I just didn't know that that's what it was until I was like the light bulb went on. And you were doing it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, Rosemary is the ultimate cheerleader for yes. women in film. She is always there to cheer and to, to be positive. I mean, really, if you're down, she is the gal <laughs> to go to to feel better. And it's not just about that. It's also about teaching and mentoring. You've always been about that. So uh, how has it been in the last year for you, since you've been steadily working for many years, has it, has it changed at all um, for you? And ha have you, what has your experience been? You've done a really, she did a wonderful pilot for Cagney and Lacey. We joke about, we joke between us about the fact that there are all these really women-centric um, uh, um, pilots that were, that were being done and then none of them got picked up. Mm -hmm. But they were all amazing and hers was Cagney and Lacey that was gonna be redone and they didn't pick it up. But um, talk a little bit about your last year and what that's been like. I think the last year has been a kind of a, a little unique just because there's you know, so much talk about women directors and, and diversity and opportunities opening up. It's kind of like a you know, like there's so much, there's so many shows and so many, there's so many things being created for so many different outlets that 
it's kind of opened the door at the same time that you know everything is sort of moving forward with like you know changing changing our society so that's been really great um for me i think i had on Cagney and Lacey, one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had because I worked with a female creator and the collaboration was amazing with two amazing actors and it was like the four of us just really creating something. And too many times I think, like what you, what Regina was just saying is interesting. It's like, I, you know, my everyone's journey is so different here. And so my journey has always been sort of trudging, at least in my head I'm always trudging, but that's why I'm such a good cheerleader, because I feel like I trudge, but maybe I'm being married to trudging when I'm not trudging anymore. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And sometimes I feel like as women, we sort of get married to this concept of like, no, it's hard for us. It's hard. No, we can help each other more if we start reaching out and, and following our dream fearlessly. I can look back at my career and say, I was just afraid and I'm talking about before I was directing, like I was just afraid to express my voice because I didn't feel entitled to express my voice. Because mm -hmm. I didn't grow up with the sense of entitlement to express my voice or the idea of confidence, which, you know, definition of confidence is like to trust yourself. It's like, well, you know, some people are born with this like confidence, you know, and let's not say that, you know, Ava comes from Oprah. And like Oprah is like, I mean, you know, we all dream about yeah. Oprah. Like she has the most powerful, like, Seriously, I mean, that's like in my psyche all the time. So, you know, I think this past year I've really begun to realize that women helping other women is really key and men helping other women is really key. And people showing up here, I mean, mm. not to downplay the work. It, I mean, if we showed up here, which easily could happen, and there was like 30 people here, I'd still love the 30 people. But it is a joy to have this room filled with people that support And a lot of people who couldn't get in. And then, and then on top of it, to have people like Leslie, you know, actually support. We really need cheerleaders because we do jobs, and in television, it's very quick. So we do jobs, and then everyone's on to the next. Mm. It is really hard. These shows, Walking Dead, Jessica Jones, these are monsters. I mean, we're shooting The Walking Dead in eight days. It's insane the amount of work to do on that show. Now, that isn't something that somebody just brand new can sort of step into, but also they will. I don't want to put them, they're awesome people, like amazing people, but that job will beat the crap out of you. Mm -hmm. And so, wait, where was I going with that? Oh, I don't know. Cheerleading help. and help. Oh, and cheerleading. Getting help. Yeah, but I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where I was going with it. I, I'm here, I have to talk about Walking Dead just because I love it so much. But, but um, oh, I don't know where I was going with that. I just love them. I was trying to get Norman to like show up here by surprise. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think he's going to, I was trying. Um, Anyway, I think, I think the past year has been really um, amazing, and right now I'm on a job um, for the first time with uh, a first AD who's a female and a DP who's a female, and I've never had that experience, and I feel like we're Can you like see the, what it is? The dream team. It's a new Apple show called Are You Sleeping? And, um, and I just feel like it's, you know, we're doing episode two, and it's like, a, it's amazing. We're not perfect together. Right. But, but it's, it's, it's really, amazing. I just had I've never had a female the first time. You too. have? I just had it. I just directed the finale of Insecure, and it was a female DP and a female first AD, and we just felt like the totally, like, it's amazing. Trinity. Like, we're like, <laughs> yeah, I feel like we're the dream yeah. team. It's like we hang out. We the have triple lunch goddess. <laughs> yeah, like we're eating lunch together. Yeah. We're like hanging. I'm like, all right, I want to bring them on to my next job. Yeah. Like, I want to keep us together. But but I didn't know that experience was, was very possible um, until this past year, actually. Because my experience is like, you know, like cats. Like, okay, make a movie, go to Sundance. Okay, then it's going to be playing at the multiplex near you. And then everyone's going to be up my butt and hire me. And it's all going to be like, I'll be doing a Marvel movie next. And it's going to be awesome. And I'll be on the stage, you know, getting the, the Academy Award for the Marvel movie. Like, that's where my head goes. And then it's like, wait, I'm back at my day job. And I'm angry and bitter. And I'm like, what the hell happened? I mean, I don't even understand this business what do you have to do around here and you know that was you know 2001 so it's um, like Patricia like I'm just like trudging you know like I said I'm not anymore I'm not going to use that word but but really you have you to have stick with the, your the walking dream. dead on the brain that's why you, you're trudging I'm trudging the zombie trudge. no I mean I don't care what your dream is you, you have to be really persistent 
and work hard and take the blows and don't take no for an answer and just keep going. And I don't think that's easy in any industry, mm -hmm. but it's really hard in one that's so male dominated, just so male and still is. You know? And that's why we have to be collaborative yeah. and cooperative yeah. with each other. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Patricia. We have to talk Patricia into being on Twitter because she doesn't do social media. So <laughs> we just have to follow her online with news and stuff. But So you have been busy because uh, she did the 33 and Miracles from Heaven, the feature films, and she's won a bunch of awards for a lot of the movies she's done. But this year, you worked on Jack Ryan, and it was the first time you'd ever done TV. So you can talk a little bit about working on Jack Ryan and also on um, the differences for you, what, what you found, what the positive differences were around TV versus film. Um, first of all, I want to say that it's incredible to see all of the young girls in the audience mm -hmm. staring. I, you know, I grew up in Mexico and I never had the opportunity of looking at a panel of female directors. I didn't know they existed. So it didn't occur to me for many years that that's what I was. So it's really cool. <laughs> um, I've shot movies and yeah, this uh, last year I went into TV. I jumped into Jack Ryan. I shot three episodes. It was a very, um, I guess, non-traditional show because there was no pilot. We just all worked at the same time. It was cross-boarded, which means all the directors had to share um, the locations and the actors and everything. And then, you know, it, it was an incredible experience, but of course I found myself being the smallest fish in the pond, right? So it was, it was um, I was new, I was the only female, and, uh, and I just had to, you know, work really hard to get the job done. Um, I traveled, I, I learned that being a, a TV director is very different than a feature director because you only have in TV a, like a small uh, amount of responsibility compared to what you do in a feature. So in a feature you're in development, in a feature you're in post-production, you know how the material is gonna end up being edited and all of that. And in, in TV, you're really going in for the shoot. You go in and you shoot and then you get out. And that was, uh, you know, once you understand what, what, that, what it is, I think it's really cool because you have opportunities that you never ever have, as a female director particularly. So I was able to do action. Uh, I had like Delta Forces working with me, which, you know, were like twice as high as me. And, you know, I, I, you know this, this year in TV has given me the opportunity to do thriller and horror and action, which I n would never have dreamt of in movies because we only get like the soft mm -hmm. female, you know, romantic that's changing work family, okay. you know, stuff. Um, so that's, that's been, and it's make, it makes you really strong as a director. It's very scary, um, but you, you know, as we all know, we just hide the, the fear and go in. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I wanna say something, because I've been hearing everyone and I wanted to jump in a few times that I think it's important. The DGA shares, um, publishes a list of um, television studios hiring female directors every year. And I found that list to be incredibly important because that was like the statistics of how many female directors were hired every year um, by all the networks. And it was like 8%. And they always said that you know, they didn't hire any more female directors because they didn't have experience, you know, which is what we've been saying. So the DGA said, okay, and they did another study and they, you know, counted again the following year, the, all the first time directors. So not only the directors working, but the first time directors. So they found out that for every 100 directors that were hired for the first time, it was still eight girls, eight women that were hired. You know, so it didn't matter if the man had experience or not. And that was a, very, a big eye opener for me. And it made me understand that I'm not making it up in my head and that I'm not alone and that all this struggle and all this suffering that I've endured you know, for 10 years of my life is not 
of my imagination, you know, and I think it's really important for um, the, the audiences and for us to be really aware because we cannot let this movement be a fashion of the year right. because it might go away, you know, it might end next year. We, we got to keep the eye on it. We got to keep the finger pointing, you know. They have to keep hiring. They have to change things. And you guys are part of that because what you watch matters. Mm -hmm. So if you're watching shows that never hire women, whether above or below the line, or don't have representation that's diverse, stop watching those shows or make, a, make some noise about it. Watch shows that support women doesn't have to be 50% yet. We're not asking for the world yet. We will get the world. We're not asking for it yet. But you have to, you really have to support shows and movies that have representation. And especially, I have to say, because you guys, getting hired doesn't end the struggle, okay? The day we get hired, the real hard struggle begins because getting hired doesn't end the fact that we have to prove ourselves every single day, every single minute that we're on a set. You know, when I, when I got hired to one of the shows that I did this year, I was so excited, yeah, I get hired, you know, that's it, I'm gonna now work and be creative and enjoy. And the first thing that I was told was, do you know why you're here? I'm like, mm, yeah. And, and he's like, because you're a woman. And you know what, we are resenting that we have, that we're being forced to hire women. Because you know why? And I'm like, no, because they're just not good. And so that was like the way I, I started my, my year in TV. So, and then I had to prove myself every single day. And I think we all know what that is right here at this table. And so, anyway, I don't know why I was saying this. Well, just to, to finish up though, having allies is essential. Mm -hmm. um, you did a pilot and you're working on Proven Innocent. And there is Danny Strong, who is the executive producer and showrunner, was, has been absolutely amazing. And I think it's essential to have allies of all sorts, whether it's Ava DuVernay yeah. or Ryan Murphy, people who are committed to parody. So I, I directed a pilot this year, and uh, I was very, very lucky that I was hired by a guy that did not fear me, and did not, and actually respected me, and gave me my space uh, to be creative and, uh, and supported me. And that was a real, like, beautiful, like, like, light at the end of the tunnel, that it is possible to work in peace and be creative and, and have fun. And I think that, because, and this is Danny Strong who created Empire and now has created this show that's called Proven Innocent. And uh, it, for me, it, it gave me hope for the future that it's possible to be a director and be happy for the first time. And I think that that's why the show came out good, because I was really allowed to just give them my, my best. And as you know, we, women are horses. We work very hard. And so I was there. I gave him my heart and soul and everything, and, and we got it. So. Well, thank you so much. We'd like to thank you for being here today. And remember to support women in film and uh, follow all of the women who are on Twitter and watch these shows and make sure that you're paying attention to who is getting hired and that, th that we're Thank getting closer you, to parity. Yeah. Thank, so you thank you so much. much.